I am honored uh, to introduce our next speaker, who doesn't need to be introduced, but still. Martin is the inventor of the Scala language and a professor at EPFL in Lausanne, Switzerland, and a founder of Lightband. His work concentrates on the fusion of functional and object-oriented programming. He believes that two paradigms are two sides of the same coin to be unified as much as possible. To prove this, he has worked on a number of language designs, from pizza to JG <laughs> to functional nets. He has also influenced the development of Java as the co-designer of Java generics and as the original author of the current Java reference compiler. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank, thank you, Oli. Uh, that's some ancient history that you have uh, uh, brought up here. I mean, the Java compiler, oh my God, that was a long, long time ago. That's true. So the, the future, of course, is Scala 3. That's what I have been working on uh, over the last uh, six, more than six years now. And um, it's finally coming out. So I'm very happy to uh, essentially give you an update of uh, where we are with Scala 3. So let me just go into the slides. Okay, so a Scala 3 update. Um, just uh, see. No, what is it? Ah, okay. okay. Uh, I had a problem with scrolling, but that should be fine now. So, first, uh, why do that? Why Scala 3? And the reason to do Scala 3 really has to do a lot, I think, with the reason why exists Scala. Why? What's the raison d'etre for, for Scala. Why, why do we have that? And I dug out a really an ancient historical slide that was part of all my early Scala talks in the uh, 2000, from 2006 maybe to 2010 or something like that. So uh, it always said Scala is a unifier. So on the one hand, it is uh, great for uh, small scripts. So you can write, uh, you have a repo, you can write really small, uh, small stuff and it grows to large systems. And the way that's done is, is essentially by a fusion of object oriented and functional programming. So that was essentially the, the history at the time. And uh, by now, I believe it has lots of languages that followed in Scala Strax. So if you look at languages like F star or C star, uh, F sharp or uh, C sharp, I mean, C sharp predates Scala, but the functional features in C sharp came after Scala's or later languages like Swift or Kotlin, they have all adopted quite a lot of essentially the approach of Scala to essentially combine object-oriented and functional and uh, imparts also quite a lot of the, the concepts and syntax of Scala. And also Java, the big tanker is moving along and with every release uh, acquiring more and more of the uh, functional features uh, quite close to the way Scala did them. So, the latest, the last one that we will expect in the next version is data classes and pattern matching, which finally came, which is essentially a, a, a funny story because when we, um, when I did pizza, since Oli mentioned it, that was in 1996, um, we presented that to some of the people at Sun and they said, well, um, you know, um, we don't need um, um, uh, closures, uh, which was one of the additions, because we have inner classes and they're good enough. Uh, and we definitely don't want pattern matching because that's not object oriented and not extensible. But the generic types, that looks interesting. So that was the start of the GJ project, which then became the Scala C compiler. So by now, finally, 20 years later, uh, I, it's, it's, uh, uh, Java has moved around and actually will have pattern matching. and. Uh, and, and some form of ADTs in the language. So it took them a long time, but they are definitely moving in the right direction here. Okay, so that was the outline. Uh, that was what Scala is. Uh, and furthermore, I think another important thing of what Scala is, is that it concentrates on flexible abstractions. Oops, oh, sorry. Uh, it concentrates on flexible abstractions instead of individual features. So that means we uh, have a rather modest language size. If you compare the, like, let's say the language grammars, then Scala is actually a lot smaller than it seems to most people, uh, despite of course, a large breadth of applications. And that essentially 
concentration on abstractions also allows us to construct very advanced libraries. We have a very rich ecosystem of high quality and, and, and highly advanced libraries. And it's also good for uh, domain specific languages, which was a uh, application area that was very important in the beginning of Scala, less important now. And finally, I should say that this library centric design is also very good for language interoperability because it lets us uh, essentially model the host language features as essentially library features in Scala. So all of this is good, but it also has some downsides. So the main downside, so first downside is that this flexibility that Scala affords uh, leads in practice to styles that are quite heterogeneous. So people apply it, essentially apply different recipes of the features to achieve different things. And that of course is also uh, partly due to the fact that Scala is so versatile that you can do pure functional programming in it, and people do, and you can do actor-like reactive programming in it, and people do, and you can have, you can do data science, and that's what, I, what another set of people do, and so on. So essentially, there are lots of different application areas. Uh, so that leads to some difference in styles, and uh, I should also say that there are some features in Scala that lead to essentially um, incidental uh, differences in styles. For instance, some people like to write all methods with a dot. I guess the majority likes to write all methods with a dot, but some people want to write methods in fix, or at least some of them. And it differs between different people and different teams. So that means that looking at a Scala program, even the optics sometimes look quite different. And that's a thing that I believe was maybe interesting at the beginning, where we said it should be great for DSLs and we want to experiment with different styles. But I think by now, Scala has grown up, we've grown up and we should be able to settle on a, on a single style and stick to it. So I think by now it's more important now to actually achieve uh, some uniformity in the way people approach Scala. And that's one of the goals that we have for Scala 3. Uh, the other uh, downside was that sometimes these abstractions led to um, essentially a whole systems view that was too low level. Uh, they expressed mechanism instead of intent. So what we try will do in Scala 3, what the goal of Scala 3 is really is uh, to work out the essence of what, what Scala is. Uh, this combination of functional and object oriented, uh, that's of course a large mantle. How can we sharpen what that is really? Uh, I think the first thing that is important here is that we have to put it on solid foundations. We have to connect it with the foundations. And unlike when Scala started, we now do have foundations that are essentially the right substrate on which to put Scala. There's first the dot calculus, the calculus of dependent object types. Then there's the SI calculus for implicits. And then there is something called lambda circle, which actually existed when Scala got started, but we didn't know about it, uh, which is a, a very nice foundations of the new metaprogramming capabilities in Scala. Uh, the second thing that we want to do is to improve the developer experience by improving tooling and binary compatibility. I'm well aware that the lack of binary compatibility between major versions is one of the sort of most annoying things that uh, happen in, happened in the Scala ecosystem. And I think we finally have the tools to uh, overcome that. Uh, the third point is drop baggage. Uh, so over the years, uh, like I guess any programming language, Scala has acquired some things that were cool at the time. Uh, and in retrospect, you say, well, maybe not so. For instance, XML at the time was really uh, something that was uh, extremely at the time people thought forward looking sort of the same thing I have like what microservices was where, where two years ago uh, absolutely the, the thing the fashion of the of the day and uh, so Scala got them uh, actually uh, I, I added them to Scala because of the insistence of Phil Wadler I guess most of you have heard the name who was at the time uh, very active in a lot of XML comedies and he said, the XML is the future and you absolutely need to be able to paste web pages in your programs as constants. And that's why you need to support XML. Uh, 
so that was the reason at the time. And at the time, lots of people found it cool. Now, I guess a lot of people will say, well, why XML and not JSON? Uh, so probably a, a programming language shouldn't do either, should have neither XML nor JSON nor other essentially specialized literals. The other thing that uh, we will drop is symbol literals. That was also a fairly marginal use case where we said, well, why, why would, why, why, why need that? So generally the whole thing, uh, the whole language will become more opinionated. Um, uh, we want to essentially show better, essentially a best way to do things and not essentially stay on the sidelines and say, we, we give you uh, a number of different uh, building uh, blocks and you can do it any way you like. Uh, that's essentially a tendency. Of course, Scala will never be Go or another super opinionated language where there's basically only one way to do things. Uh, so we can't, we, we don't want to get there. We, we can't get there uh, reasonably. But essentially where there is a unnecessary choice, we will try to essentially make 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 the choice for you and uh, and uh, have that essentially sanctioned in the language. And sometimes that is by a restriction and sometimes that is just by essentially having proposing something that is hopefully so appealing that everybody will uh, use that we'll, we'll see some examples later on okay the other thing that is very important uh, for me i think is to make it even more appealing and easy to use for beginners so i guess a lot of you laugh now and say even more appealing isn't got a super complicated language no actually it isn't uh, the, when in, in Scala's early days, there were kids 11 years old, like Shadai Ladad, who picked it up and found it extremely easy to use. Uh, and it is. So if you stick to the basics and you don't essentially buy into uh, the more advanced libraries, which of course have their place, but not for beginners, then Scala can be a very, very simple language. It is essentially as simple as, as Python and a lot simpler than Java because it doesn't have all these boilerplates and it doesn't have a public static void main and all these incantations that make no sense and uh, that, that people have to learn before they can write the simplest program. The simplest Scala program is a lot simpler than the simplest Java programs, let's say, or the simplest program in a lot of other languages. And that is also backed up by the fact that Scala is actually a very successful first teaching language in a, in a number of universities. Uh, I also saw uh, direct comparisons of Scala versus Haskell, for instance, at Leiden universities, that proved that Scala is actually far simpler to teach than Haskell to the average undergrad. Okay, the other uh, important thing I believe is to eliminate pitfalls because of the way it was put together um, by and large things work well but there were sort of corner cases that led to surprises and uh, I guess that's also inevitable in every language so over time one should be able to identify these surprises and uh, if given the chance uh, eliminate them. So generally uh, we want to improve the productivity so, sorry, and the predictability for what we do. So make pro programmers more productive, have more fun uh, writing code, and also be more be safer, uh, have, give more predictability what the code will actually do. Uh, finally, uh, we want to feel, make the language feel natural and beautiful to use. I think aesthetics are a big part of programming. Uh, we sit in front of our screens all the time, and we might as well uh, do it in a way that is beautiful and aesthetic and not in a way that essentially is a, is, a, is an eyesore. So in that sense, the Scala Love logo to say we want to do something that we all love and we want to have essentially improve the thing that we love is a big driver of what Scala 3 is about. So what's new in Scala 3? I gave already a lot of talks about it. So I'll, I'll give a quick rundown. It will not be the main uh, topic of this talk. Um, but uh, I just want to look at the uh, main topics that we, the language is about. So the first topic that I said we want to connect better with the foundations. So uh, language features that fall into that in order to do that are uh, in particular intersection and union types. So intersection types are directly supported in dot. Uh, unlike the compound types using with, which are not, 
And union types are essentially the logical dual of uh, intersection types. So these are sort of things that come out of the type structure. Also, if a language supports subtyping, like Scala does, then intersection and union types are needed to make the subtype relationship into a lattice. And being a lattice has a lot of algebraic advantages and uh, which translate directly into advantages of type inference. Uh, for instance, with union types, we can do a much better job at uh, inferring types that uh, essentially won't blow up like uh, we currently uh, have sometimes uh, when we compute the least upper bound, we get a huge type. So a union type prevents that. Uh, the other important thing for foundations is essentially that we want to push more capabilities or ideally all the capabilities of a method into a function type. So methods uh, in Scala methods and functions are not the same thing because essentially functions are values, they're objects, and methods are things inside objects. So we, they have to be different and they're connected by eta expansion. Uh, but that, the fact that they're different does shouldn't uh, prevent us from having uh, the capabilities that we associate with methods also on function types. So for instance, a method can be polymorphic the function types could not so be, be, be polymorphic so far. So in Scala 3, functions can be polymorphic. A method, type, a method could be dependent. So the result of the method could depend on the parameter value. Uh, that will, will be also uh, possible now for functions. So we will have dependent functions or uh, dependent product as it, it, it's called in the dependent type uh, uh, re research so that that addition alone will push Scala about halfway towards dependently typed languages like uh, Idris or theorem provers like Koch or Agdell. And finally, methods can be implicit. Uh, so they can have uh, implicit arguments. So in Scala 3, function types can also be implicit and that gives you a lot of additional modeling power for abstracting over contexts. Um, the uh, the next feature for the foundations is uh, type lambdas, where uh, as we, uh, with higher kind of types, we lacked so far a way to express them directly and people uh, developed very clever uh, workarounds using structural types and, uh, and type projection and things like that. So in Scala 3, those workarounds are no longer necessary uh, because we have native type lambdas. And finally, uh, the meta programming that I already mentioned uh, will be based on quotes and splices and inline, uh, which essentially gives them a very close connection to this lambda circle calculus. So the next big topic of Scala 3 is to simplify life as a programmer. Uh, the essentially day-to-day -day things that are uh, uh, make, make life easier. Uh, the first thing, for instance, is you don't need to put things always in an object or class anymore. You can write definitions at the top level, like you would do in a script. The second thing is you don't need to um, compose your ADTs using case classes and sealed traits. Enums do it for you. So enums range from simple Java-like enumerations to GADTs. You can express everything with that simple uh, construct. Uh, classes can have parameters in Scala 3, traits can have parameters as well, and that um, uh, avoids uh, workarounds like uh, early definitions or things like that. Um, exports are a useful feature to use aggregation, so a typical, a typical criticism which I subscribe to of object-oriented programming is that inheritance is overused. Inheritance is a very powerful feature. Uh, but uh, the advice is you should use this essentially only where necessary and you should use aggregation or composition instead. But the fact is that today's languages do a very poor job at supporting aggregation or composition and exports fix that. So exports are a simple way to uh, add forwarders to your classes so that you can have nested components and then a facade that just exports the uh, capabilities of these components. And the final one, which is uh, 
really quite quite trivial but uh, quite uh, pervasive in practice is that new will become optional so you don't need to write new in front of a class anymore you can just write the class name and and the arguments uh, the motivation here is to say new is basically is that it's an implementation detail a user of a class shouldn't worry about whether uh, that is that c thing here is a class or an apply method of the companion object, for instance, generated by a case class. I've seen that so far, some people uh, write case class instead of class just to get these constructors. So that's no longer necessary. You can uh, do, do that uh, uh, for, for all classes now. The new will become optional for everything. Okay, so the, the next uh, chapter of what Scala 3 does is it restricts features that are either unnecessary choice or that are unsafe. So for instance, method calls now will always be with a, a dot, with its traditional method call syntax with a dot, unless the method is declared in fix. So that means the library designer will pick a style for all its users and you will not lo no, no longer essentially give the choice to diff for, for different styles. Uh, there are also some things that were unsound in Scala 2 uh, because uh, we Essentially, we lacked the foundations to, to figure out that they were unsound. Now we have a much better ground and uh, those will go away. So one, one thing that was unsound was uh, type projection uh, without restrictions. So type projections will be restricted to the sound subset now. Uh, another thing was not unsound, but unsafe. And those were essentially pattern definitions and uh, four generators. So in the first case here, you see we have a list YS and you want to, we want to decompose it into a head X and a tail XS. Uh, that might fail uh, because the list YS might be empty. And uh, previously that uh, was uh, allowed. Uh, uh, and it could you that means that you could have a val def a pattern definition that could fail with a cast error or a match error at runtime. Uh, now that's no longer allowed, at least not in 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 under strict mode in the in future Scala. So you have to add an unchecked to it to essentially tell uh, the compiler and the reader that this cast that this pattern match might fail, and uh, and you might uh, therefore get a runtime error. Uh, the other case uh, like that was uh, for expressions where uh, you could have, let's say, a, a generator that says 4x colon apple taken from fruits, where fruits is essentially a list of apples or oranges or bananas, or all kinds of fruits. And that would filter uh, the apples out of the fruits, uh, which is occasionally very useful. I, I use it actually quite a lot, that feature. But on the other hand, sometimes you want to say, no, 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 that's not what I want. I do not want essentially silent filtering. I want it to fail at compile time because essentially I want to assert that the uh, for expression will uh, process all the things on the right hand side of the generator. So now if you just write 4x colon apple taken from fruits, that's the behavior. You would get a type error because you would say on the right hand side, we have a list of fruits and you uh, on the left hand side, you have an apple and that's not compatible. But you can write a case in front and that, that case acts like a filter. It would say, okay, in that case, we essentially only take the cases of fruits that are apples and process them. So that's the old behavior that you have here. Another restriction that uh, is actually very important, probably the most important of all for them, for me is multiversal equality. Multiversal equality rules out nonsensical comparisons. And to do that, um, to, to show you that, I thought I'd show you just uh, multiversal equal, equality in action in the Scala compiler. So let me just switch to that. Okay, so what we have here is, uh, some is uh, we have um, the Scala compiler has uh, a class name that you see here uh, and names are essentially they wrap strings they're strings with some semantics so as a first approximation there are two kinds of names names for types and names for terms so a name is not a string a name is strings plus additional info 
So one thing that uh, you can do is you can take a string and you can essentially map it to a name. Uh, you have to say whether it should be a term name or a type name. So ABC2 term name would create the term name X. So one um, insecurity is if you would then want to compare a name with a string, that's something that essentially is quite common because names are so close to strings, then uh, if you're not careful uh, in Scala 2, you would get, that would probably pass, uh, but you would always get false at runtime precisely because names are not strings. So the, the equals equals test would fail, uh, which is a, a, a bad situation because it means that you can, cannot refactor with confidence. You might actually change your types and then suddenly some of the, your equalities or disequalities might essentially become nonsensical if you haven't caught it. Instead, you, what you want is that they're caught as compile time errors. So what you get here instead is, you see here, you get an error which says values of type, term name and string cannot be compared with equals or not equals. So that's precisely what you want. Okay, so um, then uh, one question is, well, can we scale that up? So for instance, uh, can I do the same thing for uh, asking whether a list contains uh, a name? So there again, I want to say a list of names can never contain a string because names and strings are different. And here, uh, unfortunately, I don't get the error. I don't get the error because uh, the essentially the the list um, contains uh, doesn't have the right uh, the right signature. But let me fix that and uh, uh, define an extension method that now replaces uh, contains. It's called has. So you see, has essentially takes a list and uh, a, an element. And then it has a using equal tu. So that is essentially a, a constraint. It requires a type class that, e, that t and u are comparable with equality. So it's a two parameter type class. And it just is the same as contains. So has and contains is the same thing. It just, but has, has this additional type class that requires that they are equal. And what we get is uh, now essentially the same thing as before. Uh, that we get uh, the term names and strings cannot be compared with equals or, uh, or not equals. So the whole thing can scale up to also library design things. So how does that work? Uh, so uh, the type class here gave it away already. So what we have here with the name is we have an extends clause as before, and we also have a derives clause. So that's type class derivation. And uh, what the class name derives is essentially an instance of equal. So if your class does that, or you can also write the instance explicitly if you want to, then uh, your multiversal equality will kick in and all nonsensical comparisons will, uh, will uh, flag as errors. And that was for, for, for us really important if you have a large code base, because only that's sort of the one missing bit that you need to ensure if you want to do large scale refactorings and just have the assurance that essentially everything, all your errors will become type errors. For equals and not equals, they will typically, before multiversal equalities, they were typically runtime errors and not type errors. So that's a big uh, change. At the same time, multiversal equality, you see it's still equals equals. So it's not a separate type class. It's not a separate comparison. It's completely compatible with the way we write equals everywhere. It's essentially, it's, it's essentially just a separate opt-in feature. Okay, so that was uh, one little excursion here. So let me just go back to the slides. So um, the, the other thing that uh, Scala 3 does is replace uh, over time a lot of uh, old uh, concepts that essentially have been superseded. So uh, one that's, that such concept that will be phased out is package objects. Uh, they are replaced by top level definitions. If you have top level definitions, you don't need a package object anymore. And package object inheritance is replaced by exports because the only reason a package object inherited from a class was essentially composition and aggregation. It wanted to export the things defined by that class. So export is a more direct way to achieve that. Uh, the whole implicit um, set uh, will be replaced by uh, a, a new abstraction of, uh, for, for context called givens. I'll get to that. 
Uh, implicit classes are replaced by uh, specialized syntax for extension methods, and the current macro system is replaced by a new meta programming uh, system based on inline staging and match types. Okay, so the three important, three most important additions you saw that there's already a lot in Scala uh, three that, that changes and is, is is added or is dropped, but the three most important ones I think are number three the new foundation for meta programming. So inline quotes and splices are a better way to express macros uh, and at the same time also runtime staging. Uh, there's a, a, a very nice way to give con precise control of implicit searches from metaprogramming called summon from, and there's built-in type class derivation. What you have seen here with the derives thing, uh, you can do that uh, yourself. You can essentially write your own type class derivation schemes, and then the type class will have instances for uh, all uh, uh, case classes, all enums, so basically all ADPs, all sum and product types. Uh, the second most important thing, I believe, is a new way to express term inference. So term inference means given a type T generate a canonical value of the type. And that's essentially what we do with implicits all the time. But implicits have issues. Uh, so implicits have been replaced by givens. Um, implicits, I believe, are Scala's most distinguished features but they're also the most controversial ones. So a lot of people say, well, I looked at Scala, I saw implicits, I ran away. And that's not a good situation because I really believe implicits should be the reason you stay, you stay in Scala and you use Scala, they're so great. But we have to essentially make them more accessible and we have to make them safer. So that's what givens are. So givens in emphasize intent of a mechanism, the old implicit system that essentially slapped implicit as a modifier on everything that felt very much like a mechanism. So you have all these objects and defs and classes and by putting implicit on it, something else will happen and then you can build your things. But it wasn't really, it didn't really emphasize the intent. The intent is this one, given a type T, what's the canonical value of that type? That's all you need to know. Uh, and also uh, the uh, givens should make the idea of term inference more accessible and easier to use and at the same time discourage possible abuses. So here's an example of givens. Uh, so uh, we have this trait ordered. Uh, we have an uh, extension method and uh, compared to uh, between two things that are ordered. And uh, we have now an, an instance of uh, the ordered class um, which says, well, uh, we have, we, we know how to do an order of int. And in order to do an order of int, I have to define the compare to method. And here's what it is. And once I have done that, I can write a maximum method, which now would say, well, maximum uh, is defined over a list of t. And it must use the fact it using that the t, the t has an ordering. So that there is an instance of order of t. And then it can essentially use that, uh, that instance in its reduction method, in its excess reduce methods. So what you see here is that uh, the implicits uh, don't have names. Uh, they, you can give them names, it's possible, but you don't need to anymore. So the fact that you say, well, here's the canonical instance of ordered, you don't need to invent a name for that. At the same time, to say this must use the fact that t is ordered, again, you don't need to invent a name for what this thing should be. Uh, so uh, it, it means you can write things a lot shorter and you don't need to waste your time with things that, uh, that are uh, not, not important, uh, like often the names are not important. So what this gives you is really is, uh, uh, first class type classes. It's a very nice way to express that. So here's another way to essentially the typical type class example, a semigroup with a combined method, a monoid which extends a semigroup, uh, and then an instance of monoid which says, well, here's my combined method and here's my unit method. And then uh, you uh, call that, uh, let's say with a sum method where you say sum is defined over all list of t's where t is a monoid. And what you do is you do a fold left, uh, then you summon the monoid of t. So summon is the new implicitly uh, and uh, you uh, call its unit and then you reduce the whole thing with combine. 
So this is essentially this approach to, it's still the, the, the same approach as implicits before uh, what uh, the Cox theorem prover, which does basically the same thing calls first class type classes. Uh, the idea is that a type class is really a trait. Uh, a uh, instance of a type class, which we call a given, will translate to a value of that trait, uh, an instance of that trait. And um, a, a type class constraint is uh, what we express with the using section is, is really a parameter. You pass essentially the dictionaries for the type class in here. Um, so uh, theorem provers have that, uh, essentially exactly the same system as Scala has. And I believe with the givens, we, we work out essentially the essence of that much better. Um, also what you should see here is that uh, these things were previously really hard to do uh, because of the, uh, the infix uh, methods that we have here. Uh, that required essentially very, very elaborate scaffoldings and imports. Uh, the, the simulacrum uh, macro library did that, but even with, with simulacrum, you had to do a lot of things just right to get that. And now everything works out of the box because of the way essentially these type classes are integrated with extension methods. So one thing that also goes away is implicit conversions, uh, which uh, basically I believe have been overused uh, by and large. Uh, implicit conversions still exist, but now only as a special type class. So there's a class conversion and you can have an instance of that using givens. So you can say given conversion string token, and then for the conversion, you have to uh, define the apply method. So you can say that, well, the conversion class, which is essentially a, a subclass of function string to token, its apply method is the thing that converts a string to a keyword. Or you can also use an alias given, then it's just like this. It's given conversion from string to token equals keyword. That, that you can also write. And the most important feature, I believe, uh, at least for me, is optional braces. Uh, so uh, the idea is that Scala 3 will make curly braces and parentheses optional in more places. And instead of places, uh, braces, you can use indented blocks. That's uh, by itself a fairly trivial and, and small feature. It's handled course, uh, just in the in the front end in the, in the parser. And it's, if you look at it, not really terribly important. Uh, because as a fact, there's a lot of code variation already today. So for instance, if you have an if then else here, then some people write uh, braces around both of the parts from here to here. And, uh, and the other braces go in the else. Uh, some people uh, object to the else after the closing brace, uh, including myself uh, lately. I, I find it very unappealing to have the else hiding behind the closing brace. So I tend to spend an extra line and put the, brace, put the else on a new line. So sometimes it's like that. And uh, sometimes, of course, uh, we, we leave out the, the, the braces if there's a single branch. So I guess a lot of us do that. Uh, but then we have to come back and add the braces back if we want to have more than one statement on one of these branches. And we don't even have um, agreement on how to lay out this. So for instance, if I look at how he use libraries, he tends to write the if and then immediately the open, the open parent. So there's a lot of code variations in all these things. And what the uh, Scala 3 will offer is a little bit more variation. Uh, so we now also allow this. So no braces at all. You just have, have the two sides or even better, you don't even need parents around the condition of the if anymore. So you just can, can just write it like that. If in the token equals left parents then, and then the then part and then the else part. So that's an additional way to do things. You might say, well, uh, didn't you say you want to become more opinionated? Well, my prediction, uh, which, maybe it's crazy, but I stand by it, is that in a short while, everybody will write this code and nobody will write the old, the old code with, with parents and braces. So in that sense, it's actually something that will lead to more uniformity and not less. 
other uses of the new syntax you see here. So for instance, for a for expression, you don't need, you need neither parents nor braces anymore for the generators. You just write them after the for, and then you have a yield and then the, the, uh, the expression as usual. Uh, for a while, you don't need parents, you write while do. Uh, for a for loop, you also would write for do, not for yield. And for a match, you don't need braces either. So you write, for instance, an option match, and then you just write the cases like this. Uh, same thing for a try, you write try body, and then you could write a single case like this, catch case, exception, handler. Or if you have more than one, you, then you can indent them uh, after the catch, and if they line up, uh, then, then that's fine. So optional braces, of course, is very controversial. So uh, they, I, I never have seen so much discussion. So uh, we were uh, a bit scared and we added it as an experimental feature last autumn. And I've now used it very heavily for more than half a year uh, where I used that syntax exclusively. And believe me, I, I worked quite a, quite a bit. Uh, I had a lot of commits to the, to the Scala compiler over the last half year. And I must say that the experience has been positive beyond everything I could expect. It's, it's far better than, than I, I, I dreamt of. I thought it would be good, but I didn't, I didn't imagine it would be that good. Uh, I believe overall it's the single most important way how Scala 3 improved my productivity. Again, you will say that's crazy. I mean, we have all these heavyweight features, the uh, exports and extension methods and multiversal equality and, and the givens and things like that. But no, I mean, because that's the one thing that you, that you use every day, you use in every line you program. You use it and it makes your life easier in every line that you program. So why does it make your life easier? Well, there's one thing that is, is oh, measurable that programs become shorter. Uh, you get a more than 10% reduction in line count. That's basically all these closing braces that you have to have to add. Um, that by itself, you might say 10% is not much, but it is essentially line count that's imposed on you. You don't have any control. There are 10 to, uh, or five closing braces. You have to spend five lines to do it because that's your coding guideline. And that's when you give up essentially control over the layout of, of, of your program and also over the beauty of your program. You become essentially an automaton that where, where essentially you put this. You might as well write your programs in XML. And there are reasons you don't do that because essentially that wouldn't be a legible or beautiful format. The same thing applies to braces, much less uh, strong than XML, of course, but nevertheless. Uh, the other thing that I believe matters a lot for writing programs is that uh, as a writer, you stay in the flow. So if you use braces, then essentially as soon as you change something, let's say uh, an if then else uh, uh, condition um, branch becomes two statements instead of one, let's say you add just a debug print uh, in, into your program, which I have to do a lot. Uh, then every time I do that, uh, I have to essentially, after I added the debug print, I have to go up and add an opening brace and I have to go down and add a closing brace and then I'm back. By that time, I'm out of the flow. Whereas uh, with indentation, I just add the print and where, where it belongs and that's it. So this simple thing makes life incredibly uh, uh, simpler uh, because it's essentially something that happens all the time. So a good analogy that I want to make here is that indentation is really like uh, Lego bricks. Uh, you put your bricks, your statements, where they belong at the right indentation, of course, and that's it. There's nothing more you need to do. You just put them where they belong. If you compare that with braces, then bracing, braces are like bailing wires. So you have you have something and then you put another thing and they said, no, no, then it won't fit anymore. I have to wrap something around it to make it hold. And wrapping things around it, that's basically putting an opening brace and a closing brace. I mean, the braces even look like bailing wires. So that's really the, 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 the uh, ergonomy, the, 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 the work, workflow that you have here. So would you rather use Lego bricks or bailing wires? That's the question. Um, people were uh, essentially predicting lots of downsides that essentially would become super fragile, errors wouldn't be detected, refactorings would, uh, call, would end in catastrophe and things like that. Uh, in my experience, there was not a single thing. Uh, program changes were a lot more reliable with braces than with braces. With braces, often when I did something, 
uh, a lot of changes then suddenly I got a hundred errors uh, in the parser and I had no idea yeah I, I, well I knew I, I missed the opening or closing brace somewhere but where I had no idea going through the program every, everything looked okay so what I typically do then I don't know about you but that was that's my um, way to deal with it I uh, I looked at the diff of the, of the last revision and said ah yeah here there's this brace with indentation, you never have to do that. I, I promise you, you never have to do that. There's never a single issue with things. Uh, of course, uh, to, that's not a statement about all indentation syntax. I'm well aware that maybe in other languages it's different. I know, for instance, in YAML, which I also use, it's terrible. Uh, but uh, so the details matter. And we took a lot of time and several trials to get it right, but I think we got it right. So I'm, I'm, I'm really happy with the result in the end. So roadmap, where are we? Um, we are in April. Uh, we had for a while all features fleshed out with implementations uh, in Dotty from Dotty 021, I think. Uh, now we're at Dotty 024. Uh, we are currently in the period where we want to stabilize, want to finish the SIP process to essentially officialize the changes. Uh, want to write docs, spec and user-facing docs, migrate the open source ecosystems, flesh out the tests and community build, and invest in compatibility and migration tools. And hopefully that will lead in late 2020 to SCADA 3.0 final. So that's when, when we still plan the release COVID-19 uh, uh, or not. So for stabilization, uh, we have essentially regular releases, uh, timed releases every, every six weeks, and new ones, and each new week uh, release contains bug fixes and usability improvements. And I'm also very happy that Dotty support now appears in uh, the leading editors. So it was just merged uh, in Metals. Uh, it's in a nightly, not yet in a, in, a, in, a, in a release version, but it's in a snapshot version and also IntelliJ. So both of them uh, are starting to uh, use um, Scala to, to, to support Scala 3. And of course, that's absolutely essential that we get there. The SIP process, so the SIP committee, the Scala Improvement Committee, is reviewing the complete language. We had the last meeting in March 11 to 13 that was basically just when the lockdown happened in Switzerland. So the first two days were in person, the last day was remote. It was a weird, weird feeling, the first re fully remote meeting and from one day to the other. Uh, we managed to discuss most features at that meeting and also at the meetings before. Uh, some result features were changed or dropped as a result of the discussion. And uh, we invite community feedback on the Scala Contributors Forum. So we have about two thirds of the changes completed by now. I can just quickly show uh, where that is. So, uh, uh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have it. I should have. So here you see the, the Scala contributors and there's a Scala 3 feature status overview uh, where essentially you see the current, the current situation. So you can show that. And we also have essentially for all the features that haven't been discussed yet, which you see that's essentially those here. Uh, we have, uh, we will open contributor threads. So uh, one which uh, is one of the latest, which is very active, is about main methods. Uh, so it's one of the proposals here. So if you're interested in shaping the future of Scala 3 and essentially giving your opinion and your advice, then uh, that's, that's a good way to, to, uh, to interact and to contribute. Okay, uh, so going on, uh, migrate the ecosystem. So I'm very happy that uh, many libraries have started migrating. And what we try to do is essentially have a 
a, a, a set of those libraries in the Scala 3 community build, which essentially will serve as a, as a check that every new version of the compiler and the language can still build those libraries. And I'm quite happy to say that we have quite a lot of them in the community build. So from algebra to Zio, uh, having uh, heavyweights such as Scala test in between, is, uh, we, we have quite, quite, quite a few of these libraries already in in the community build and more are coming so keep it up uh, we were really happy to get more of these things into the community build and uh, that way develop a hopefully uh, complete ecosystem of libraries by the time Scala 3 is actually released uh, we uh, have also Scala Center has also recently compiled a migration guide and uh, there should be hopefully more uh, news and more uh, uh, progress on tools for migration in the future. Um, so to, to conclude, you could say, well, this, there, there's an awful lot of changes. There's an awful lot of work to get to Scala 3. Is Scala 3 maybe a new language? Uh, is, it, is it maybe just something, what relationship is there to Scala 2? And I would say, well, the answer is yes. Uh, we have lots of language changes. We remove some features, so it's not backwards compatible. Uh, the new constructs improve user experience and onboarding. I think for a new user, it will look some, somewhat different, uh, hopefully better than Scala 2. And it also means that the books about Scala will have to be rewritten, the Scala 2 book. Uh, by itself will essentially be outdated if you want to learn Scala 3 from it. On the other hand, you say, no, not really. Uh, it's still recognizably Scala. All the core constructs remain in place and there's a very large and practical common subset between Scala 2 and Scala 3. Uh, quite a few programs that can cross build. So for instance, Scala test, Zio, or earlier versions of the .A compiler. By now, we essentially sn uh, uh, cut the cord to, to Scala 2 because we want to use our own dark food. We want to use the Scala 3 features in the .A compiler. So by now, the latest version of the .A compiler are not fully compatible with Scala 2 anymore, but large parts of it are still big because they haven't changed lately. So the, I think the real the answer is it's, it depends and it's a process. So Scala 3 keeps most constructs of Scala 2.13 alongside the new ones. That's why it's possible to define, this, to, to define this large and common subset. So some constructs will be deprecated and then phased out in future 3.x releases starting with 3.1. So that means that for, for 3.0, we have some temporary duplication, but the end result should be a more compact and regular one. So I just want to do some quote of Josh Zurith, who has uh, uh, experimented with Scala 3 a little bit. He said some uh, expletive that I like it. Scala 3 will be amazing. It's very much a new experience and very much still Scala. So I like that quote. So one thing that uh, we were asked a lot is why are, so, are there so many features at once? Uh, uh, couldn't you have faced these things in one by one, one, one feature after, uh, and after another? And I guess the answer is, well, the, the problem here is Scala 3 is by definition when the books will be rewritten. So we need to get something in now if it affects the foundations, if it simplifies life, especially for learners, because then it should be the book in the books. And if it replaces an existing feature, because then again, a book doesn't want to uh, explain the existing feature that will go away in Scala 3.1 or 3.2. So that essentially forced our hand that we had to put a lot of things into 3.0 and that it's, 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 it's a huge upgrade from 2.3.13. Uh, but we were careful to really restrict it to the things that were absolutely necessary, which means we prioritize foundations, simplifications for developers and restrictions, and the things that we leave for, for possibly later versions is added power and, expressive, and expressiveness for essentially more specialized expert users. So that's something that we said we have so much in 3.0. Uh, if, if it's something that primarily gives, gives more power to essentially an expert user, it's still something that might be worth to have, but we can delay it. We don't need to have it in 3.0. 
So um, one uh, question that uh, was asked a lot when I talk about Scala 3 is, will this be a Python 2 versus 3 situation? Uh, and I believe no, uh, and for three reasons. Uh, so the first reason is we don't need to migrate everything since Scala 3 can use Scala 2 binaries. So it means the Scala 2 library, for instance, the standard library and uh, the 213 library is usable from Scala 3. In fact, there is no Scala 3.0 standard library. This uh, it, it, standard library is shared between the two. And that means also for, for other uh, things that essentially all Scala 2 libraries that are published in Scala 2.13 are usable from Scala 3 as they are provided they don't use macros uh, or they don't expose macros to APIs because macros don't port that way. So macros are the big caveat. For macros, you have to put in extra work and typically essentially source, source versions uh, to have versions of macros that work for Scala 2 and a different set of macros that does the same thing for Scala 3. That's what we see right now is the main, the main effort in porting is really macros. Uh, the second reason why I think things are much better than the, when Python went from two to three is that we have strong static typing. So we can actually migrate in confidence. Errors will typically be caught in the type system rather than at runtime where you're not sure whether you have all the tests or whether the error will show up in production. So that's a big advantage. And uh, th three is I think there are actually lots of benefits from uh, uh, that you can obtain from migrating to Scala 3, unlike when Python 3 came out. When Python 3 came out, basically it was all pain and not a lot of gain uh, that Python 3 had over two. Over the years, Python 3 got uh, uh, acquired uh, a lot of more interesting features. So by now it's pretty clear that Python 3 is a vastly superior language to Python 2, but it took a while. Whereas Scala 3 will be a vastly superior language to Scala 2 from day one. So I think for these three reasons, I imagine that the migration to Scala 3 will be a lot smoother and also a lot faster than what happened in Python. So how to get there? Well, I said there's a large common subset with source compatibility. Uh, we have rewrite to some rewrite tools so far mostly implemented in the Dotty compiler itself. Uh, we should hopefully have more uh, other tools when Scala 3 comes out, but so far they haven't, they haven't materialized yet. Um, I just want to talk quickly about binary compatibility. So today Dotty can link with Scala 213 class files, I should say. So I can have a Dotty module that uses a Scala 2 library. Um, we are very close to actually have the, the opposite as well. So the opposite would be that a Scala 2 module can depend on Dotty or Scala 3 module, again with the binary. And that will be achieved by making the Scala 2 compiler understand Tasty. So, um, so uh, the, we are current, the Scala Center is currently working uh, on a reader uh, in Scala 2 for Tasty, where Tasty is essentially our intermediate format. Where that contains a complete representation of Scala 3 programs. So it's Jamie Thompson who works on that and he's quite far advanced. So hopefully you should see that soon. Uh, so uh, the other thing is binary compatibility. So once we have Tasty, which essentially represents a complete Scala 3 program, we plan to make it uh, compatible over the whole 3.x series. Probably not from 3.0, that's a bit too, too ambitious, I think. We want to settle it first, but maybe 3.1 or 3.2 after that will freeze the format. And that means that we can essentially use tooling that compiles from, uh, from Tasty, and that means that we won't have binary compatibility problems because uh, old versions of programs can migrate by, uh, since everything is in Tasty, can be transparently recompiled for, two, for new versions of the compiler or for different platforms. So that's a big, uh, uh, hopefully, advantage that we will have in the future. And that should do away with the binary, binary compatibility problems that plague uh, the Scala ecosystem now. Thank you. So uh, I was, I'm already over time. Uh, maybe we take quickly some questions, I'm happy, and otherwise I'll be in the breakout, breakout room for the pass.